Good morning. I hope that you are doing well today and that you will find some refreshment in our time in God's Word. Let me open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with us, that you would draw near to us just now. Help us to understand more of who you are in your word, that we might worship you as you desire to be worshipped. I pray that you would, in many ways, impact us, change us, and help us to be more like Jesus Christ. Use this time to prepare us for the day ahead, that we might give you much glory. In Christ's name, amen. Have you ever heard that expression? It crops up sometimes in various forms of media of flies and the ointment. Someone will say oh, the, the, um, he or she or that was a that was a fly in the ointment. And, and generally, you recognize that that's uh, that's a negative thing. But there's so much that we say in our, our popular expressions and these colloquialisms that actually find their origin in the Bible. And so I take us back to one of these, that one flies in the ointment. It's found in Ecclesiastes 10. Ecclesiastes 10 says, verse 1, dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. Now what I want us to discuss today is um, flies in the ointment, how foolishness frustrates your journey to joy. Let's be honest about it. When we're looking in life at what is going to provide joy, and Solomon in Ecclesiastes is trying to find joy, he's trying to find meaning, identity, purpose, and fulfillment. He's looking at, at the real root of happiness. In our journey to joy, a primary frustration, the thing that keeps us from joy so often is foolishness, often our own foolishness. So we, we see um, the, the reality that foolishness, it's, it's exhibited by us and by others. It's very evidently harmful in our lives and the lives of others. And yet tragically, even though it's very evident and it's exhibited on a wholesale basis every single day, foolishness is endemic in our society. Now, uh, it's been said by one uh, that no world or thing here below ever fell into misery without having first fallen into folly. That is a statement by Carlyle. No world or thing here below ever fell into misery without having first fallen into folly. Let me submit to you, first of all, that foolishness flaunts weakness. Foolishness flaunts weakness, okay? Let's walk through Ecclesiastes 10 here. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So, he says, this is the, this is the significance of that. You might think, well, well, how does that relate to foolishness? So, a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone that he is a fool. Do you see it there? Foolishness flaunts its own weakness. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. It flaunts itself and considering itself wise to a degree, but it celebrates its folly. It's, it's bizarre. The fool announces to everyone in this sort of celebratory way, he says to everyone that he is a fool. And that's not just because of his words also, whether it's spoken or not, whether uh, someone uh, speaks of themselves in a disparaging way is foolish or not, it's certainly seen. The fact that the fool is walking in this way on the road, lacking sense, exhibits the foolishness of it. I live on a street where I routinely hear people in the street shouting at one another because uh, it's common for people to treat that road as if it's pedestrianized, and it's not pedestrianized. People treat it as if it's pedestrianized, but you have a major cycle highway that goes through without any barriers or differentiation between cycles and uh, other vehicles. 
And those walking in the road often um, aren't, aren't looking very carefully and sometimes the cyclists aren't looking very carefully and this creates a lot of foolish argument and a, a lot of um, swearing and disruption outside. Even uh, recently, I've seen this on multiple occasions. The fool is the one, he says, who walks on the road. And he says to everyone that he is a fool, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses uh, to rest. Foolishness flaunts weakness. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. The, the fool is incompetent and dishonest, manipulated in some cases, but also, interesting, manipulative. Um, now, some might think, okay, well, what is this, the heart of the wise inclines to the right and the heart of the fool to the left? And no, uh, although I'm sure there are many statements concerning it, it doesn't primarily relate to your, your politics, although one might could make certain cases for that. But the right hand was considered widely in ancient days, and even to some degree today in, in some cultures, as the side of strength, skill, and favor. The wise man's heart is known and a strength to him. But that's not true of the fool. The fool, his heart is at his left. Uh, the left is seen as the weak and as the bad, the opposite of the right. Uh, the Latin word sinister means left. It's interesting. Sinister, you know, uh, th that's normally a negative. Something's not right will say. And it literally is not right. It's left. It's sinister. Um, to have one's heart at his left side is to have the springs of life that Proverbs 4.23 speaks of located in the realm of practical and spiritual incompetence, it's been said. He shows everyone that he is a fool. A foolish man or woman has a way of making their folly evident in such a way that um, is obvious in the fruit of their life. Consider the fruit of your life. And you, you might find yourself regularly complaining. I'm just going to say something that might be difficult to someone who's watching this. Uh, your life is filled with bad fruit. There's bad stuff that's always happening. There's foolishness that, that's around your life constantly. There's always some form of drama. Ask yourself why that is. Is there some foolishness in your life? Do you find yourself getting into situations, bad situations, because you are living and acting and speaking and thinking, I'm going to be very brutal here, like a fool? It's what Solomon suggests. Don't take it from me, take it from Solomon. Um, in, in this case, he, he's beginning, now that he is establishing and considering more concerning eternity, he's considering and begins at this point to diverge away from his under the sun thinking, where he's only thinking about the here and now. He's beginning to look at um, some things in a, a much wiser sense. He says that the foolish one flaunts weakness. And our society even today, in some ways bizarrely, tells us at times that we should celebrate our weaknesses. And that's not something that we find in Scripture. We, we can boast in our own weakness before God and how He is the one who saves us, uh, that we're not strong enough to save ourselves. But um, to, to boast in those things that lead us to sin, to boast in folly and foolishness is, is not right. Foolishness flaunts weakness. Foolishness falls in its walk. A moment of foolishness discounts one's wisdom and honor. He says, even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense and they show everyone in that how stupid they are. Their wreckage is evident. Foolishness will fall as it walks in the wrong way and the wrong place. The scriptures tell us that we should trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding and all our ways acknowledge Him and He will direct our paths. But when we walk along the road of our way, when we do things our way, we will always fall and the wreckage that follows after that 
will be painfully evident not only to ourselves but to those around us. Foolishness falls in its walk. Foolishness flees from work. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. I've seen it. You've seen it. You may have done it. You may have experienced or um, or known of it to happen where an individual under management and under authority uh, quits their post. They quit their role. They quit uh, their position in a strop because of the anger or the Um, in some cases hasty and sometimes rash and sometimes unfair words of the one who is over them against them. Do not leave your post. Calmness lays great offenses to rest. I've seen far too many people who when they encounter inconveniences in life, when they encounter disturbances, when they encounter some upset or someone being upset rightly or wrongly with them, they throw in the towel. They give up. Solomon says, This is foolish. Don't do that. Don't be hasty. Do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. If there is a false accusation, be calm, be measured, be controlled. That will send an example to those around you of a right way to respond to those things. Speak in a way that is clear, that is honest and sincere. Do not try to, um, definitely do not take credit for something that is wrong. Do not take um, uh, credit for something that is right that you did not do. Be honest and sincere and transparent. And though there may be those in authority over you whose anger rises against you, God knows and I believe we have reason throughout Scripture to see, will vindicate those who trust Him. Okay, so foolishness flees from work. The toil of fools wearies them. It's not just if someone's upset, if a boss or management is uh, upset. Um, What about the work that you do? The toil of fools wearies them. They do not know the way to town. Woe to the land whose king was a servant and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed is the land whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at a proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through laziness the rafters sag. Because of idle hands the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry and money is the answer for everything." I've seen much idleness, I've seen much laziness depicted even tragically among those who profess the name of Christ. It has no place among the Christian in their life. It really shouldn't. And yet it is there. When we work, there's constant complaining, there's constant grumbling sometimes, there's constant dissatisfaction and discontent. I've seen it time and again where people, they have provision from God and they dishonor that provision or they despise that provision that he's given. Other times where, um, where people have roles and responsibilities but, but are not fulfilling those roles and responsibilities in the way that they ought to be. And so um, he gives the very pictorial image, though through laziness the rafters sag because of idle hands the house leaks. Tragically, I've seen this in many cases. Um, you, you can think through even church buildings, okay? The church is not a building, we know that. But there are church buildings sometimes that have trustees and have people who are over them who do not care for the resource, the great resource that God has given. And because of idleness, laziness, and procrastination put off proper application, and it dishonors God. That's on a bigger scale. There's also smaller scale um, where, wherein we ourselves just constantly push responsibilities and constantly push the work that we need to do into the distance. And that's not right. That's something that we should not do. Foolishness runs away from work. 
Foolishness fears the weather. This is another thing. Foolishness fears the weather. It's, it's, it's very practical. That's one of the things about Ecclesiastes I, uh, that I love. While sometimes Solomon's conclusions are not right and they can sometimes be um, devoid of that right understanding of perspective beyond, uh, th there is much practically that we can relate to in our day to day. He says, ship your grain across the sea. After many days you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. Okay, this is, um, this is just the reality when you, you look at, um, at the difficulties in our day-to-day -day life and the excuses that we can give. This is found in uh, chapter 11, chapter 11, where he speaks f further about this, this foolishness. Invest in seven ventures, yes, and eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. Whoever watches the wind, this is the application, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. Foolishness fears the weather and does not make the right investments and does not make the right applications at the right time. Foolishness looks at the weather and says, I'll hold off, I'll wait on that. Um, and it fails to capitalize on opportunities that in some cases are God-given. Foolishness does not think in a big picture way. Solomon is beginning now finally after uh, throughout Ecclesiastes thinking in this small way of life under the sun. He's beginning to show that there's a bigger picture. There's something beyond what seems evident in the here and now. In a microcosmic sense, the fear of the weather and the not doing certain things in this agricultural sense, he says, um, you know, ship your grain across the sea after many days you may re receive a return. If someone's afraid of a storm on the sea, they're not going to ship their grain. It's foolish because the grain then is not sold. There is no return. Maybe there's a storm and the investment will be lost. Maybe. But one cannot know until they put that grain in a ship and sail it away in the hopes of receiving a return. Invest in seven ventures, He's, uh, this um, common sense of diversification. Yes, in eight, you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. Clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. So th th this is a, a, a good thing. So plant. Don't look at the wind. If you look at the wind, you're not going to plant. If you look at the clouds, you won't reap. Take the actions that God has given you in the day to day. So just a, a recap, foolishness flaunts its own weakness. Foolishness falls in its walk. Foolishness flees from work. Foolishness fears the weather. And finally, foolishness forsakes true faith. Foolishness forsakes true faith. Now, this leads us to having um, considered the flies in the ointment and how foolishness frustrates our journey to joy. Uh, it, it leads us to a, a point of conclusion, finding the anointed and how faith fulfills your journey to joy. In chapter 2, a wise man's heart inclines him to the right. Be strong. We already said that the right side was known for strength. That's what he's saying there, practically speaking. Be strong. He's not talking so much of physical strength, though there's nothing wrong with physical strength. He's, he's talking primarily of that strength of character, that strength of wisdom that's had when we find ourselves rooted in faith in Jesus Christ. That strength that is given to each and every believer. Ephesians 6 speaks of, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. It's about ability, the ability to go through life with the righteous perspective of forever, the righteous perspective of heaven. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Having done all in life, stand firm. Having done all against the trials and temptations that the devil may fling your way, we're called to stand firm. So be strong. Be sober. 
Verse 3, even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. Sobriety is the opposite of foolishness. Sobriety is the opposite of lacking sense. It is filled with sense. Verse 17, happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of the nobility and your prince's feast at the proper time for strength, that strength that we've already been called to have, and not for drunkenness. So be strong, be sober, be stable. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place. Put anger away from you. He says calmness will lay great offenses to rest. Stop being so angry. Stop complaining all the time. Stop doing things that are upsetting your life and keeping you from joy because you're you're, you're only looking at the small picture. Stop allowing yourself to be completely controlled by the inconveniences that life throws your way. Be stable. Having done all, stand firm. Again, Ephesians 6. Uh, Be sharp. Be sharp. Verse 5. What does verse 5 say? There's an evil that I've seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many places high places and the rich set in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. You see, he's he's saying, be be sharp. Make sure that that axe head, that iron is not blunt. Make sure that it's sharp. And if you do that, you won't have to apply so much strength. It's brain, not brawn. Um, This is one thing that I heard growing up quite a lot. Always uh, apply yourself in a way that is thoughtful. That fits in with that sobriety that we were speaking of a minute ago. Be skillful in how you apply uh, that sharpness. You can have knowledge, but if you don't have wisdom, that knowledge is nothing, right? You, you can have knowledge, but if you don't have understanding, the knowledge is for nothing. So seek to be understanding. Be skillful in how you apply the wisdom that God gives you. Wisdom helps one to succeed, verse 10 says. Be well speaking, verse 12. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The words that we use have great potential and power for good. They also have great potential and power for evil. You've seen it in your own life. You've had words inflicted on you, and you've inflicted words on others for evil. But they have such a powerful usage for the good as well. Be well speaking. Verse 13, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. The mouth, the lips of a fool consume him, he said. The end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be and who can tell him what will be after him. Stop feeling like you have to always talk. Stop thinking that you always have to be saying something. Don't, Don't speak wrongly. Too many words And those words multiply and can be wrong words. Step back. Learn to listen. Stop complaining and grumbling. Don't fill your words with um, toxic things. Be saving. Chapter 11, verse 1 through 2. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. That's that investment that we were talking about earlier. You do not know what's going to happen. So make sure that, that you are using the resources you have wisely for the here and now, but also making sure that you save for the future. Invest. Be sowing. Verse 6. In the morning sow your seed. Chapter 11, verse 6, In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of variables. Take some risks in your life. There's so much crippling of faith because there's not the realization that faith involves stepping out and often risking. But if you have confidence, conviction, and are conforming your life to that of Christ, you can you, you can. You can know the satisfaction of bearing fruit. 
Ultimately, that's where he ends. Be satisfied. Be, be satisfied as you apply these principles, as you apply these truths, you will find much joy. And ultimately, all of these find their fullness and their, their, their final place in salvation. Be strong, be sober, be stable, be sharp, be skillful, be well-speaking, be saving, be sowing, be satisfied, be saved. Find the anointed, the one Jesus Christ, who was appointed as the Messiah, anointed for this particular purpose, to save us from our sin so that we might put away foolishness and embrace the wisdom of God, so that we might put away those things that cause our downfall, that uh, cause us to live in flaunting our own weakness, failing in our walk in real ways and in, um, in spiritual ways, that cause us to flee from the work that we have, that weary us across life. Leave all of that behind and look at the anointed, Jesus Christ, who sets us free from folly, from fear, from failing. Trust Him and in Him and His victory, find your victory.